Are you Tony Stank? Yes, this is, this is Tony Stank. You're in the right place. Thank you for that. Is there an Avengers group chat? Yes, there is. <laughs> Who's the most active? Probably Ruffalo. Probably Mark. <clears throat> what are you doing? Uh, we, we don't do that here. Hotel Rwanda. You work at the Hotel Diplomat. No, I work at the Mikolin. I knew nothing about uh, what had happened in Rwanda. Terry George, who directed it, reached out to me. I read the script. I thought it was amazing. He said to me in my meeting, very, you know, uh, up front, like, I need to get this movie made. I have to get the budget. Um, right now they're talking to me about Will Smith or Cuba Gooding Jr. and I'm going to make this movie with whoever gets me the, the, the budget because it's a story, it's too important, it needs to be told. And I said, 100%, I'm, you know, it, I would love to help you produce it even if it's not me who's gonna get the role because I agree this is a story that needs to be told. But ultimately the, the role came my way, thankfully, and I started to dig into the research about it. I saw a frontline piece about Rwanda that Paul was in just you know, learn through Terry and also other members of Paul's family. And that's sort of how we went into it. When you're portraying a real person, you're trying to find where your spirit and their spirit kind of meet and the things that you have to take on from them and the things that you have to bring that are of you to them and you to it. And somewhere in the middle is where that the new, you know, it's not you, it's not him, it's some amalgamation of the two of you that you're trying to find to just tell the truth of the story and that's the most important thing is to get to the truth of it and to not do some sort of a an imitation or an impression we were with paul uh, a lot during the, the the filming of that movie but he was a great resource obviously which was kind of intimidating to play somebody who's you know sitting right there but ultimately i was very glad to have him there the whole time we knew that after Paul came back from that driving on that road that we needed to have, he needed to have a visceral moment, but we didn't know what it was going to be or how it would be expressed. And so this went on for weeks. And then finally one day he said, I think we have to shoot it. And I, I said, I think it needs to be something just simple. It needs to be just simple. I said, well, let me just come back and see blood on the tie and we'll just shoot it in threes scenes like see me get the suit see him washing off the blood and then see him tie the tie and he can't tie the tie and, and something very simple is that he can't tie the tie takes him down and we did it and we shot it twice and it was two takes and we i think we used the first take it was not scripted we just knew that something needed to happen we had survivors that were in the movie that were extras in the movie just talking to them about the realities of what had happened and their experiences it's just yeah it's not it's not just a movie you're walking back into a traumatic traumatic moment in history with these people who are still dealing with it um daily and will never be over it so no it wasn't something that you just put down and walk away it's, i still talk to his family uh now that movie sort of launched a lot of my own personal work um, with activism in and around Darfur and Sudan. It had a lot of reverberations past, the, past just being a movie. Marvel Cinematic Universe. The committee would now like to invite Lieutenant Colonel James Rhodes to the chamber. Rhodey? Hey, buddy. Didn't expect to see you here. Look, it's me. I'm here. Deal with it. It's famously known online how you on vived Terrence Howard for the role of Rhodey. Oh, I Aunt Viv'd him? I, I did not move Terrence out of a role. He was not, they had decided that they weren't, that was not happening. And it was an open part. Um, and I was at my kid's laser tag birthday party and they called me and said, this is what's happening. Um, we're giving you the offer. If you don't say yes, we're going to the next person. This is, has to be, this is going to happen very fast. So they said, why don't you go ahead and take an hour and decide if you want to do it? I said, it's, it was a six movie deal. I was like, in an hour I have to decide? Like, what are the other movies? They're like, it's going to be these Avengers. It's going to be these many Iron Men. This is what it is. So you kind of have to say yes or no if you're in or out. Like, what's the trajectory of the character going to be? Well, they're like, we can't, we don't know any of that. But 
this is what it is. So you've got an hour. I said, I'm at my kid's laser tag birthday party. They're like, oh, take two hours, take two hours. So, <laughs> so we played laser tag for two hours and I was talking to my wife and we just kind of thought about it and talked to my agent and tried to get as much information as we could and we just took a flyer and said, okay, we'll do it. We don't have to do this, Tony. You wanna be the war machine, take your shot. Put it down. You gonna take a shot? Put it down. No, drop it, Tony, take it. I'd done some special effects work before that and, you know, acting to tennis balls on top of a C-stand, you know, it's, it's, it's a lot to get used to. There's no bigger platform and no bigger sort of special effects toys and bells and whistles and stuff than Marvel, of course. But ultimately, it's, you're, you're still ultimately trying to do the same thing, always, is create believable circumstances for your character to step into inside your own head so that you believe what it is that you're doing and then the audience can believe. Hopefully the favorite one that I'm going to do is Rhodey's movie that we're going to shoot. I think in, in every successive film he's becoming more and more out of Tony's shadow and becoming his own person. But I still think we haven't really figured out who he is and really dug into that. So that's what the movie is for. It's going to be a series now we're going to do it as a film. Armors. So I'm looking forward to that. It's been like 12 years now which is bananas that you know from that moment uh, till now we've been doing it for so long. And it just it just keeps expanding and growing and these universes keep you know, folding in on each other and different characters being introduced and relationships popping up. So I haven't seen any scripts. I don't know where it's headed, but uh, I'm excited about the potential. The Oceans Trilogy. So unless we intend to do this job in Reno, we're in Barney. Barney Rubble. Trouble. Big ensemble. Everybody had to play their position and everybody had their specialty. I, it was a lot of grinding on an, on an accent that, you know, I've been both vilified and praised for. All right, chaps. Hang on to your niggas. Nothing was real. <laughs> we weren't really blowing stuff up. I mean, sure, there were some pyrotechnics and, you know, controlled things. Most of that stuff was just, you know, movie magic. Steven knows always exactly what it is that he's going to do and how he's going to do it once we're going. You know, he, he has a plan, but he's able to adjust and, and, and move with the plan. When we came back to do the second film, we hadn't seen each other for a long time. We hadn't all been together. We were just reuniting, so we were just milling around for an hour. And then we realized, oh wait, we're actually here to shoot something. And we all stopped and took our attention to Steve, and he was like, are you guys all where you want to be? We're like, yeah, he's like, okay, all right, go to lunch. And we came back, and there were marks on the floor, and camera positions and lenses and moves and all different color chalk. It was like a beautiful mind on the floor. He had choreographed the whole scene. You've gone right out of your tree, my son. He's mad. It's madness. Yeah, it's crazy. It's, it's no, I love it that the second movie is the one that people will just unabashedly walk up to you and go, yeah, I hated that one. That one sucked. It's like, cool. You just said that to my face like I'm not a person. But all right, thank you. But that was actually, for us, the most fun of all of them. When we were in Italy, we stayed at the Derussi Hotel. We had the whole sixth floor to ourselves because we really couldn't go anywhere, you know? Paparazzi is an Italian word. We really were kind of sequestered, but they, they were able to give us that whole floor and all of our families were there. So my kids were there and Matt's kids were there. And we, you know, we just like toured, toured Europe with, in this gr big group. And it was just a lot of fun. Everybody just had, a lot of fun together. Devil in a blue dress. Hey, you want me to shoot this son of a bitch easy? Mouse! Huh? You want me to shoot him? Oh. oh. I had worked with Carl Franklin, the director, before I, he had uh, done an AFI project I was in. So I came in and I was just, in his head, stuck in the same age. that he, I, was, I was 19 years old to him. He was like, you're not Denzel's contemporary. This isn't going to work. I'm 10 years younger than him. But uh, I came in and read and he was inspired and had Denzel come in and I read with Denzel and we had an instant chemistry and the rest is just kind of history. What's wrong with you, man? Don't you ever grab me when I got a gun in my hand? Shit. You got blood on my coat, easy. It's a damn expensive coat. Well, we both, you know, come from a theater background and both had a very similar way of working and both really 
were interested in creating these characters and, and, and this relationship and digging into what our history was and how we understood each other and the shorthand that we had. Obviously, I was impressed and a little intimidated at first to work with Denzel, but once we got on set and just started doing it, it was just a couple of actors coming to work. You just said don't shoot him, right? That's right. Well, I didn't. I just, I, I choked him. What? Well, how am I going to help you out if I'm, if I'm back here fooling around with him now? Easy, look, if you ain't want him killed, why'd you leave him with me? That line is just hilarious that there's a person who's dead and it's your fault because you left him with me. I mean, just the logic of that. I don't know how that can't be darkly funny. I think, you know, it wasn't to play it for laughs. I think the humor just came out of the situations and Mouse's perspective on things, which for him was just matter of fact logic. You know, I'm a killer, you leave a dude with a killer, he's gonna kill him. It's like, what? <laughs> That's on you, kind of really, when you think about it. And it was something that literally we found in the audition. Uh, it just kind of went that way. And it became something that just was their relationship. Oh, look here. Now, I'll cut you in for half because I know you was too big a fool to take your chef from that white girl yourself. All right. I think that year was kind of a watershed moment for me. That movie did, you know, get a lot of attention and a lot of critical attention. So that was probably for a lot of people where they became aware of me. I had done a lot of movies uh, that year and just started the ball rolling for, sort of as a feature actor. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. This is dope, man. I'm just gonna kick back here for a few days, let somebody else do all the work. <laughs> Excuse me, young man. In this house, everyone carries his own weight. <laughs> Too easy. There's a lot of gangster movies during that time, and you know, if you're a young black actor and you could be in a gangster movie, that was a thing, but then there was a, a lot of people going like, why are these the only kind of movies that we can do? I didn't know any of them personally. It's the first time I had, I had met them, first time I had met Quincy, first time I met Will. Obviously, I knew he was a rapper. I knew, you know, his, his I knew him from that world, but I didn't know anything about his acting. I thought the part was gonna be fun and, and something just cool to do and, you know, just to work with this new talent who was super green and was, you know, mouthing our lines as we were off camera, you know, while he was on camera mouthing the lines that we were saying, so he had to get up to speed, but it was a, it was a lot of fun. Hi. <laughs> Hi. That's the one person actually that I did know before the show. It's fun to work with your friends, um, and it's fun to uh, be in an environment like that where everything is just like new and popping and we just had a great time and then after the I think third day of rehearsal they came to me and they said you know we want to um, do a show around around you so there was um, a pilot that we actually shot called uh, in the house that never went to air and it never became so they later kept the the name it was a completely different concept and everything you know I wrote the music for the the, the intro and all this stuff and it was going to be on right after Fresh Prince and so the show went the way of the dodo bird but that was that was going to be an interesting sort of back to back Boogie Nights You're not being fair This isn't fair This financial institution cannot endorse pornography Stop saying Try that Will you quit You've saying pornography understand. why are you doing this please. to me I'm an now, actor please. I'm sorry Carl Franklin, directed uh, Devil in Blue Dress, had met Paul and, and known him and said, this dude's wild, you gotta meet this dude. He's a young cat, it's like he's the most confident, cocky dude I've ever met. And he wants to talk to you about this movie. And it was, I said, well, you know, what's the movie? And he's like, it's Boogie Nights about the porn industry. I was like, oh, my parents are still alive. I can't, I can't do that. And he said, oh, you should meet him. You should meet him and, 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 and see what you think. So we went to a deli and as advertised, he was very cocky, very self-assured. It was like, you know, this is, if you, if you say no, you're going to really be disappointed that you didn't do this. So I think you should, I think this is something that you should do. And so I went back and told Carl, yeah, this dude's a trip. And he was like, yeah, but I really have a, a good feeling about him. So I just, I took a flyer and said, yeah, I want to work with him. And it was great. We had a great experience. <sighs> A lot of blood. <laughs> that was a, a, a crazy scene, yeah. And I think Paul just had a very, you know, very strong vision about how he wanted that moment played. And it's an insane, obviously it's an insane moment, but that focus, that push into the money and that push into Buck, and he's like, I just wanna see all of your dreams, the stereo store and you know, 
being finally having the opportunity to be the person that you want to be and establish yourself and all of that just communicated in that in that push and in and in his face as he's drenched with blood and brain matter it was it was crazy but you know it's the kind of stuff that Paul's great at I've been very fortunate to have some great ones where where these characters are very full to work with very good directors who know how to bring that all to life and create sort of the sandbox and let you play in it. And Paul was very collaborative, although he had very clear ideas. He was open to like how you wanted to bring stuff and the ways you wanted to bring stuff. So it was just a very creative, and that cast is amazing. It's a lot of just great actors and just a great environment and some and, and a movie unlike any movie I'd ever seen and or heard of until that time. Of course, Captain Planet. Let's spruce this place up a bit, huh? Okay! <laughs> well, the Funny or Die team, I had done one of their first Drunk Histories with Will Ferrell playing Frederick Douglass. And then on the set of Oceans, I think, all the guys were talking about, you know what really, what we really need and what really doesn't exist, and it's a shame that it doesn't, is a, a ball spa for men. So <laughs> I pitched this ridiculous idea for Sax West, was a ball spa, and George Lopez did it, and Cedric the Entertainer's in the clip, and Ray Romano, and Joe Montaigne, and just Halle Joe Osment, all these idiots came together to do this thing. And I said, okay, well, while you guys are doing this stupid one, we have this thing called Captain Planet, which we want to do, uh, would you like to do it? I didn't know what Captain Planet was. They're like, oh, he's like, Captain Planet's animated, he's gonna save the Earth, and you did this, all this stuff for the environment, you know, you're the Goodwill amb Ambassador for the Environment Program, we think this is a great fit. So I read the thing, it made me laugh, and I was like, yeah, so let's do it. So I'm sitting down in the makeup chair, and they start to come over with this blue face paint. I was like, what's that? They're like, well, it's Captain Planet. I'm like, I don't, I don't wanna do that. And they're like, well, this is how Captain Planet looks, and they showed me the picture of him, I was like, that's ridiculous, I don't wanna do it. And I almost left, and they, I don't know how they talked me into doing it. Somebody talked me into doing it. So I did it and immediately regretted it after I did it. But then I saw it and it, it made me laugh. So I thought it was pretty funny. And now it's ridiculous how many people talk about that character. I can't let you do this, Captain. I mean, they were just like, we, what's the craziest thing? How can we end this in the craziest way that we can? So let's have him be like the good guy, you know, and be the guy that would be your hero on Saturday. But he's messed up in his head. That Captain Planet was very messed up, clearly. Remember, turn off the faucet between usages and recycle those plastics. Or else, I'll turn you into a fucking tree. Captain Planet, motherfucker. Crash. In L.A., nobody touches you. We're always behind this metal and glass. I think we miss that touch so much that we crash into each other just so we can feel something. He's a very cynical character and a very seemingly, you know, disaffected and, and, and burnt out kind of a kind of a cop who has a mother that he's very disappointed in, drug addict, you know, a brother who's a criminal. Like, he's just in this broken family. The dad ain't around. He's a very broken dude, I believe. I promise you, I promise <gasps> I'm gonna find out who did this, Mom. Oh, I already know. You did. One of the best moments for that character in that movie is after his brother is is killed, after he discovers that his brother's killed and has gone to his his mother's house, you know, prior to that and bought her all the food and brought all the groceries that she says, you know, as they're, as they're in the morgue, you know, the last thing your brother did was brought me groceries. You know, it was the last thing he did. Like it's saying to him, like, he was the good kid and you're the bad kid and that he doesn't correct her. He just takes it and it just gets broken some more came home. Did you know that? My little boy. When I was sleeping, he brought me groceries. It was a tragic character. And the movie, I think a lot of people had a problem with that movie because they sort of took it. They, I think they missed the broader point of the movie in some ways, which is, in my opinion, not to be taken as literal and in some ways is more allegorical and a lot of what if and sort of sliding doors 
situations with these characters bumping into each other's lives and crashing into each other's lives in these ways. Yeah, another great ensemble cast. Low budget, you know, grind. One of those movies that you show up because you just want to tell the story. It's not about, like, let's all get paid. It was, you know, just really, really good cast and really solid filmmaking. Traffic. Sure, I can't offer you something to drink. I can offer you a joke. You want to hear a joke? I got, I got, I got a joke. I got a joke. Come on, bro. It's just a joke. Let me tell one joke. Can I? I'm going to tell you a joke, okay? All right. Why a hurricane named after woman? I don't know. Because when they arrive, they're wet and wild. When they leave, they take your house and your car. <laughs> Again, amazing director, Steven Soderbergh. He called me and said, I've got this other movie I'm going to do. It's not exactly a triptych, but it was kind of three, you know, different uh, looks at the, at the drug trafficking. It was based on a UK series. And he was just like, I want you and I just see you and Luis Guzman as partners. Three different styles visual styles, bridging that all together, having these characters move in and out of each other's lives. It was just really a, a, a cool experience. Another really cool experience with a lot of great actors. And Louise and I, you know, became really good friends after that and still are in each other's lives today. They're whispering. They're whispering. Hello. I can't hear it. I know. The fucking bug's too far away from the room, man. I told you it's halfway to the kitchen. We're not going to get shit. They're saying something. Sounds like they're conspiring to conspire. You know, I could feel the light vibrating from that home. <laughs> I don't think she's in on it, man. Come on, I dream about this. I have actual dreams about this. About busting the top people, the rich people, white, white people. people. I, know, I know. One of the joys of the job is that we get to learn a lot about a lot of different things. And we get to inhabit a lot of different characters and, and get to kind of stay in school, you know? Get to always be a student of people and a student of... of different genres and just a student of the crap. It's one of the most fun things about the gig, getting to play make-believe and things that we were doing is that we all did as kids, right? But with the best toys and the best circumstances and best props and best other play actors playing around you. So it's always, it's always something to look forward to and why the job just never gets old. Not coming this way. If you look at the scene where Louise's character is killed, it doesn't make any sense on film. It's two blocks. You could use the fresh air, you know? I've been stuck in that piece of shit hotel room for two weeks. I don't give a fuck. Let's you just, let's just stop you know standing around and go. I want to walk because I want to walk. Not because he wants to like walk, okay? It's emotional. My character is destroyed. He's lost his partner. This scene doesn't make any sense. But you are with those characters. And you want, you're invested in the characters, you're invested in their emotional, in their emotions, you're invested in the story, you're invested in their journey. So I've, I, you know, I, when I t ask people about that scene, nobody's ever batted an eyelash. But when I go through it, they're like, oh yeah, that doesn't make any sense. And I said, yeah, and I talked to Steven about it, and he said, right, it, it just goes to show you, if you've earned the audience, you know, you can do a lot, because they just, they're invested in the characters. Why Noah? Noah does very interesting movies, and this is a huge departure from the kind of movie that Noah does, both in size and scope, it, except for sort of the interpersonal character dynamics. And still, it's a movie about characters and about relationships, but it's wrapped, what it's wrapped in is this huge, big, dramatic undertaking of this event that is happening that is impacting the Gladney family and every, all the residents of this town. What happens? Katsakis, my rival, is no longer in the land of the living. He's dead, lost in the surf off Malibu. It's a farce about death. You know, I think it's really is what it is, is a, a commentary about our inability to control our circumstances. And at a time like today, it's a very interesting time to, to have this film come out amid elections and COVID and the Supreme Court and January 6th. I mean, everything is just sort of looming and making us have to deal with over and over and over again the shifting sands under our feet. I think it's a very timely uh, moment for this movie to come out. Now, I have a feeling about mothers. Mothers really do know. The folklore is correct. Hitler adored his mother. He was the first of Clara's children to survive infancy. 
Elvis and Gladys liked to nuzzle and pet. They slept in the same bed until he began to approach physical maturity. They talked baby talk to each other. Hitler was a lazy kid. His report card was full of unsatisfactories. Gladys worried about his sleepwalking. She lashed out at any kid who would bully him. Gladys walked Elvis to school and back every day. She defended him in street rumbles. But Clara loved him. So David and Adam and Noah and myself kind of just worked that moment out. We knew that we wanted it to be like a performance piece, that it wasn't just going to be two professors lecturing. We wanted it to feel like a duel. We wanted it to feel like a dance. We wanted it to feel like some big moment that, for Murray, my character specifically wanted to sort of bring more attention to himself and, and bring some sort of dynamism to his lecture, his Elvis lecture that he needed to like work in a little Hitler to like really spice it up. The supermarket is a waiting place. It recharges us spiritually. It's a gateway. Look how bright. Look how full of psychic data, waves and radiation. All the letters and numbers are here, all the colors of the spectrum, all the voices and sounds, all the code words and ceremonial phrases. The supermarket is the place where, you know, you want to fight for normalcy. And I think it's, it's a real commentary on, like you said, consumerism. In some gross ways, you know, our desire to have instantaneous comfort and immediate calming effect on us. This is a very American concept. It doesn't exist in most places around the world in the ridiculous amount, in the ridiculous way that it exists here. But it's also... Uh, I think the movie is kind of a love letter to the 80s and a love letter to 80s filmmaking in many ways and you know sort of Spielberg kind of feel in some ways it's got a lot of different genres that it's incorporating in this movie so it's a big it's a big swing Noah took a really big swing and I think it's kind of expansive and, and really fun.